Hello and welcome to the ACCE Learning Network Hangout. <laughs> it's a place we can briefly dis disconnect our brains from the blackboard, a moment to network with friends across the world. Amanda. And as per usual, if you're listening to us live, then you can post a question by going to todaysmeet.com forward slash A-C-C-E-L-N and on Twitter you can use A-C-C-E-L-N hashtag. I'm Roland Guesthouse, I'm a high school teacher in Leading in Victoria and I'm also on the State Council of the ICTEV. And did you know that tomorrow, I think, is the Cat in the Hat's birthday? Amanda. <laughs> well, I'm Amanda Rablin, and this year I'm the e-learning coordinator at St Peter's Lutheran College. And did you know that today was Towel Day? There you oh, go. that's right. Don't yes. <laughs> <laughs> and tonight we have a very special guest, Pia War, who's going to be joining us to talk about open government and information freedom. So I'm really excited. This is going to be fun. Um, perhaps if we can introduce our guests from uh, left to right. Go, oh, Bruce. Okay, so Bruce Feuder, teacher from Canberra. You can find out more than you want to know about me at http colon slash slash me. And um, tomorrow is also Canberra's birthday, 100 this year, which is quite exciting. You didn't know you shared that with a cat in the hat, did you? <laughs> <laughs> I can see the connections, though. <laughs> thing one, thing two, and thing Canberra. Let's keep it civil. Okay, Chris, go. Fat cats in hats. Um, my name is Chris Badger. Uh, and I'm a teacher. That's all you need to know. <laughs> An award-winning teacher. <laughs> Chris rocks. Thanks, Chris. And Jason. Uh, I'm Jason Zagami. I'm a lecturer at Griffith University on the Gold Coast, where I do research and teaching into educational technologies. Thanks, Matt. And um, Peter, would you like to introduce yourself? Okay, uh, so just briefly, my name is Pia War. Uh, I work in government at the moment. I'm a what you might call a professional geek. I basically get in uh, to the nuts and bolts and try to make the world a better place through technology in all the things that I do, which uh, you'll hear more than you probably want to hear about very soon now. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So, Pia, tonight our topic is around um, open government. Can you tell us a little bit about um, what is meant by open government? Sure. Okay, so um, I'll just start by saying um, just a very brief background. Uh, my background's 10 years in the IT industry. Then I uh, read and um, did a bit of study about the background of, uh, I guess, the Australian democratic system, and um, I got very angry. So I, I wanted to go and learn how the system worked better. I'd been involved in doing a little bit of lobbying and advocacy around things like the um, US-Australia Free Trade Agreement and um, procurement policy around different types of technologies. And um, so I, I managed to, um, through a great opportunity, go and work for a politician for three years. Now, I'm not a party politics person by any stretch of the imagination, uh, but I went in there to do IT policy and to um, learn how the system works. And it was really exciting to sort of see how things go from being a policy idea, a twinkle in someone's eye, to being uh, formal government policy. So after three years of that, I wanted to go and work in government uh, so that I could try and contribute to um, making things better in government. Um, personally, I think that government has a really useful role of actually creating a, a certain amount of equality and opportunity in society, and, um, and it has a huge role in, um, I guess, trying to um, ensure that all people have as much access to opportunity as they, they possibly can. So I sort of went into government very much from a public service and civil service kind of perspective. And um, one of my big passions for a number of years now has been around open government and around open data. Um, open government, we only really, there's a lot of definitions for what that means. A lot of people think of open government and they think of freedom of information laws. But um, it's so much bigger and broader than that, particularly when you start throwing the internet into, into the mix. Because um, what we're seeing at the moment, which is uh, very profound and very interesting, is that um, uh, pretty much every traditional um, institute and structure in, in uh, society as we know it is being challenged um, in, a, in a fairly um, profound way. Uh, we're seeing all of the traditional um, bastions of power um, upon which our society and hierarchies have been built, um, not, not so much you know, destroyed or anything like that, but um, massively distributed to everyone. So um, if you start thinking about um, communications, you know, that's massively distributed. Anyone can communicate with anyone. We are living in a peer-to-peer -peer society now. Um, if you start looking at 
publishing. Anyone can publish. Um, it used to be the case that only the people that could afford the, the means of production, you know, to, to quote something famous, um, you know, could actually um, do publishing and, and spread knowledge and, and spread a, a particular um, in, interpretation of history. Um, what monitoring is now massively distributed, it's not just um, from the top down. I mean, Foucault would love the internet. You know, anyone can monitor anyone, and that's a, 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 it's a fascinating concept when you start thinking about the ramifications of that. And the final two, uh, enforcement, the fact that a couple of kids with a computer can actually disrupt uh, an economy or a country or a project or a perspective is a, is a fascinating sort of world that we live in. Um, final one, I sort of always talk about these five, um, that we're not quite there yet, is with 3D printing, and once you start combining that with nanotechnology, if you can imagine being able to feed matter into a compiler and it sort of, you know, um, deconstructs things at a molecular level, reconstructs it at a different molecular level, and then prints whatever you can imagine, um, we're, we're about to hit an age where we have massively distributed, easily accessible property. So all of these things are now massively or in the process of being massively distributed, which is a, a huge uh, challenge because it is changing the expectations of citizens and people everywhere, rather than the assumption that you, know, you have to go to someone else to get knowledge, you know that you can get it for yourself, rather than the assumption that the official word or, I mean, when I was a kid, you know, Encyclopedia Britannica was the single source. You went to Encyclopedia Britannica as a kid to research, you know, whatever project you had at school and it didn't even occur you to you to question whether the people who wrote it had a particular interpretation, uh, it, you know, or whether that was correct or not. You know, the concept of um, he who wins writes history, right? Um, what's happening now is, um, and we saw this with, I think, the Iraq war was really prevalent for this, because you had the the story coming out of the official um, you know the official story of what was going on, but then you had Salem Pax, which was a blog um, by a gay architect living in the middle of Baghdad who was reporting on what was going on as it was happening. So we're sort of starting to get a, a society, an online society anyway, and let's you know we we all understand that there is a digital divide and we all understand that that is a problem. Um, but let's just put that to the side for the moment. In, in terms of the online community, there is a, um, a whole bunch of assumptions that, um, that are starting to, to come into mainstream society um, from the, the people that are online. And those assumptions are peer-to-peer, -peer, anyone can get access to whatever they want and whomever they want, um, anytime they want, and, and that is a whole different thing from what's come before. The concept of routing around damage. Mm. If someone or something, or a technology, or a satellite dish goes down, or you know, whether it's physical or technical or social, if something actually gets in between you and what you're trying to achieve, then you know, you people have an instinct to how to get around that. This concept of no single gateway or truth um, it starts to breed this um, sometimes healthy, sometimes not healthy skepticism. Um, but but understanding that there are multiple versions of truth is really good because it starts to challenge people's perspective that maybe it is just a perspective and not necessarily true just because that's what they were taught being uh, growing up. Now, of course, this is really challenging for government, which is used to being a single source of truth and a single source of um, uh, law and enforcement, all those things. No less is it, it is um, extremely challenging for teachers. Kids used to come into the classroom and the teacher was the source of knowledge. Now. The teacher, in the same way as the government, is the the, the facilitator of knowledge at best, um, and um, and the kids know that they will probably know things that the teacher doesn't, and so that creates a very very different power structure and a very different type of relationship, and no less so with with citizens between government. I'm going a long way around, but basically where I'm getting at is that. Um, the, the world has changed and continues to change, and unless the way that we do government and that we do traditional um, hierarchical institutions that serve the public, unless we change the way we do those, then we will become less relevant. I like to, you know, say that um, we, we need to adapt or die. You know, we are living in the most Darwinian of times, effectively. Um, so Gov 2.0, which is this wanky term, and you'll have to excuse me putting it that way, but I get, as a technical person, you know, Web 2.0 was just as meaningless as Gov 2.0, but it's become kind of a term, so I'll, I'll stick with it for this conversation. Gov 2.0 isn't so much just about open government, because open government's been around for a long time. We have one of the most open and engaged and democratic governments in the world. Um, we went to a conference last year and, um, you know, talked to people from over 20 countries uh, about open government and what they're doing. 
and so many countries were actually rolling back freedom of information laws and rolling and we're actually getting a lot worse um, which was really um, quite humbling to see because sometimes you need to appreciate what you have um, through seeing what other people have um, doesn't mean that you be um, lax like we still have a lot of work we need to do but it's it's important to appreciate that we do actually have a reasonably good system at the moment um, but gov 2.0 is about um, uh, adopting technology and the internet and these these changing times that we're facing um, and figuring out how we can actually create a better democracy and, and government um, from that. So it comes down to three kind of core things. Um, first of all, is it's about openness and transparency. Uh, when you actually um, make a, a policy statement and you can back that up by the data and the process and the transparency of the decision making, um, then people will trust it more. You can have the best policy in the world, but if you don't back that up, if you don't actually get public buy-in to that policy, then you're going to end up with a, a situation where um, the people won't trust it and the people won't buy into it and the people will reject it. And then, you know, is it a successful policy or not? Well, you may have implemented perfectly, but if the broader population thinks it was a failure, and I can think of several policies that have gone down this route, then it's questionable as to how successful that policy has been. Um, and, and a lot of people in government and particularly in politics find that concept very, very difficult to, <laughs> to, to deal with. But transparency and, and openness is, is the first main pillar of, of Gov 2.0, which uh, an open data fits into that, but I'll come back to that. The second one is engaged democracy. The idea of actually creating policy in a, in a transparent way and actually um, inviting people into the process of developing policy, of implementing policy, of monitoring and, and reporting on policy as, it, as it's happening um, is a, a huge challenge at this point. Generally speaking, not only because you can tap into the expertise and experiences, um, some of which may not be from people who are notable experts, but they will still have something useful to contribute, um, whether it be through um, the perspective that they have uh, or whether it be through the way they act. I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that. Um, you can ask people what they think, and um, but you can also observe what they do in order to to capture um, uh, um, data points to help you make a decision. There was a university in the U.S. I think uh, where a dean did this huge competition for you know uh, where to lay down the paths for the university because they just redone the university grounds and um, and you know they got back of course basically one per student. They were very creative and right through it, very functional, but there, there was no real way to categorically categorically say that one particular way was the right way. So what they did was um, the dean said, okay, well, I'm going to ignore them all. I'm just going to put grass seed down. And of course, everyone was very frustrated and very cranky, but whatever. So a year passed, and of course, all the students just naturally walked to class. And what happened was the, observa the observed outcome of that was uh, the grass didn't grow where the where the ground was most walked upon and that, event, that eventually actually created the design for the path. So they ended up basing the design of the path on the evidence of where people actually chose to walk. Um, so there's um, engaged democracy which is about co-creating the future of how we do things together which gets citizens buy-in, taps into citizen information and knowledge and, um, and also gets a, a direction which, um, which is likely to be more sustainable and more uh, successful. And then the third pillar of, um, of Gov 2.0 is what we call citizen-centric government. And what I mean by that is, um, uh, you know how you have to go and, and figure out which department is hosting that particular service and which sphere of government they're in in the first place, and then you've got to go to their website, and then you've got to around them so you can find the right phone number to call, and even then you've got to the wrong area, and so they put... It, it, it's all based around the machinery of government at this point in time, by and large. So. Basically, to figure out where to get anything, you've got to figure out whereabouts in government that thing is being hosted. Canberra is the one exception to this. Canberra is actually really cool because um, they have a thing called Canberra Connect where you can go into a, you know, a Canberra Connect store or to the Canberra Connect website, change your, you know, your address in one place and it goes to all the different directorates um, simultaneously. Um, and you can actually access all of the services through the one place. Um, but by and large, certainly federal and most of the other states, uh, you have to actually have a basic understanding of the machinery of government in order to access services, which is insane when you think about it because people don't care about the machinery of government. And the machinery of government changes every three years or so and, um, and sometimes in between. So in government, we end up spending a huge amount of time um, just coping with the fact that our basic structure has changed um, in order to get anything done. If we took this concept, and it's a beautiful concept of 
government as an API, right? What that means, and I don't know how many programmers um, are listening to you, but what an API is, is that it's a programming interface for an application. What, what that means is it's a way that you can, um, uh, I'm going to try to not use technical terms, but I probably will. It's a, it's a way to interface with a system um, in whatever way you want to. If you, rather than have you know, just a website for a particular service for a particular um, department, you could say, okay, well, we're going to take the services and the data and the information um, about health, and we're just going to be able to have a health website which just talks to the information and the services and the data wherever they are, in whichever department they are, in whichever um, air, a level of government they are, local, federal, or state. Um, then um, you can actually wrap um, a create an experience for a citizen which is unique and based on what it is they're trying to achieve, as opposed to which department they're supposed to go and talk to. What this government is an API concept means that um, you can um, just seamlessly continue to provide services in a thematic way which is responsive to the changing expectations and needs of citizens. And at the same time, um, behind the scenes, the machinery of government can change as much as it wants because the services are going to continue to be provided in a way that can be aggregated usefully and thematically. So to come back to open data, which is kind of the core topic of all this, open data is all about the understanding that there is a lot of public information, um, not public, there is a lot of stuff that is created by government just through doing its job. So for instance, you might have the, um, the, the floors of an ocean mapped for a particular research project. I mean, all the huge amount of data that is created out of research projects, largely which is publicly funded, um, is, a, is a lot of data that often enough gets remapped because a particular research project will close down, they publish their papers, they don't need the data anymore, they, get, they throw it away, and then the next research project that requires the same data goes and recollects the same data. So there's a huge opportunity to have open data approach to research, and they've already done this in the UK, where if you want to, um, as part of your funding requirement, you have to not only make your research papers available, but you have to make the data and any software that was created in the process of making that paper publicly available as well, so that other researchers can continue to build upon it. Now in government, we have a lot of spatial data. We have obviously census and statistical data. Um, there's a lot of um, things about, I mean, even just something as simple as the budget. Um, at the moment, the government releases the federal budget in a Word document or a PDF or a um, RTF, but they're all document formats, and to get the raw data, you basically have to go and copy and paste from that, and some people have done that. There's a really good really? project called the o yes, theopenbudget.org, which is a fantastic project. They went and screen scraped all of that data into a, um, you know, a raw data format so that then they could visualize it. So then you can actually click and interact with the uh, federal budget um, in a useful friendly way. Raw data gives us the opportunity not only to do data visualization, which is really good for testing policy, for doing analysis, uh, for communicating really complex ideas in useful ways. Um, it, also, it also gives you a chance to um, actually glean new knowledge because a lot of people see data visualization as just this way to make something pretty for people who can't be bothered understanding the facts. But actually, you can quite often come across completely new understanding about what's going on through the effective use of um, analysis and data visualization tools. But you can't do that without raw data. So um, getting access to raw data is really important. There's, there's crime statistics. There's, there's so much raw data that's um, available in government that um, isn't available to the public. We have seen a bit of a revolution, though, starting to occur. A few years ago, we had the gov 2 task force, which was a, a government project to look into open government and what it means in a digital world. And uh, there was a lot of recommendations about open data. We now have a federal government policy which says that all government data should be released under Creative Commons by default, unless there is a very, very good reason to do otherwise. Of course, that's been in place two years now, and it's really only starting to get momentum now. Um, Data.gov.au was launched a couple of years ago, and um, uh, and it hasn't really changed much since, hasn't really adapted to the new technologies yet. Uh, I'm now in charge of Data.gov.au, and um, that's all I can say at this point in time, but there are certainly some big plans for it. Um, and um, there's been a, the uh, Office of the Information Commissioner just came out with a big report about the state of open data in Australia. If you want to check that out, it's called From Principles to Practice, and it's a very, very good report that um, goes into some of the concerns that departments and agencies have. But I can tell you, it was really interesting. I actually brought uh, Sir Tim Berners-Lee out to Australia about a month ago and uh, took him all around Australia and New Zealand, uh, got him in front of um, uh, you know, important decision makers in government, but as well as the general public and academia. And it was really great because it really created that, um, it gave us just you know, another bump in the momentum around this stuff, which has been building for years.
community, people who really care passionately about this stuff in Australia, both in civil society and government, in the industry, in academia. And, um, and the, the, um, so Tim's visit really helped um, push everything forward. And I've noticed a whole bunch of new data sets just being released. Uh, in fact, my department just released um, all of the historical um, government contract data back to 1999, just the other day. Uh, so you can go and have a look at all the statistics of all the contracts that have ever been over ten thousand dollars that have ever been entered to by um, federal government, which is really exciting. And the opportunities for better academic input, for better peer-reviewed perspectives, um, for for industry to innovate, um, when you actually have that raw data available, then companies can go and scratch an itch. It sort of takes us into the question about mobile devices and apps, and I, I say apps with quotes because um, you know an app can be anything, and there's a lot of people getting all excited about apps development, and then they'll go and build an iPhone app, and then of course a no one else can access it, and b it breaks the moment a um, a, a library changes in the app store, um, and it's the same with all the platforms. I'm not picking on Apple for any particular reason, um, but um, from a government perspective we have a responsibility to make sure that there is um, uh, equal access and that there is a certain amount of, um, uh, you know, that, that, that it's inclusive of people and that you can actually ensure uh, continual uh, service delivery. So responsive website design is actually a far better way to deliver government services and information to the public via mobile phones um, because you can be sure it will work and then you can wrap it up and put it into app stores and stuff as an app even though it's a responsive website so long as you explain that and are very clear and transparent about it. Um, but if you make the data and the service APIs available as well then you're basically saying, look, we're going to we're going to do responsive websites because we care about um, service delivery, we care about consistency, we care about inclusive access to these services and information. However, by making the data an API, where industry can go and compete on making the best possible service delivery that they want to make, so um, it actually becomes a nicely um, balanced kind of approach. Um, I could talk all night, so rather than go on much more, I'll just say that um, there's, uh, we did have a declaration of open government launched in Australia a couple of years ago, and, um, and it was actually quite good. It went into three core things about informing, engaging, and participating, and really trying to reframe how government engages with the general public. If anyone wants more information about Gov2.0, um, I highly recommend checking out either my blog at pipka.org, um, Senator Kate Lundy's blog, who I worked for, she's got a whole sort of, she's done lots of great speeches um, that um, uh, around Gov 2.0 and open government. Um, I would also highly recommend checking out uh, agimo.gov.au slash Gov 2.0, or sorry, Gov 2.0, which has a whole bunch of information. I mean, there's now hundreds of um, government accounts on social media and blogs and um, a whole bunch of outreach projects of trying to do um, co-design of services or policy. Um, and there's a lot more outreach now happening and a lot more data starting to be published. So it's very exciting. And we've got a whole of federal government um, um, geospatial uh, data plan that's in the process of being made right now. So the next year or two, I think, are going to be extraordinarily exciting. And I'm, I'm really pleased to be working in government at this point. Um, if you want to see other information more generally, check out Open Data Institute, uh, the Open Knowledge Foundation Network. Um, and in Australia, there is a community of us. I would highly recommend you follow hash gov2, the number 2, AU. Um, and uh, there is a Google 2.0, um, a Gov 2.0 Google group that you can join where um, sort of updates go out to that every so often. In Canberra, we have monthly meetups with people in this space. So, um, yeah, um, and we put the videos of that stuff online. So, um, oh, and in a month, I've actually got someone from the Open Data Institute from the UK coming to Australia. And I've also got um, uh, someone from the New Zealand government uh, who's an absolute expert on open data coming to Australia as well. So, we'll be uh, recording and putting online. So. If you're ever interested in this stuff, um, please uh, get in touch with me. I'm at Pia War on Twitter. And um, yeah, it's, it's a very exciting day, and I'm looking forward to getting more people involved. Wow. Sorry, I speak very fast. <laughs> no, it's good. Is that enough? <laughs> no, I, look, Pia, one thing that really jumps out at me is the, the data thing, yeah, as a developer myself, I completely understand the need to have that data raw in a way that it can be accessed. But that strikes me as being the simpler of the pillars to attack and the really difficult one from, from my perspective and coming at it as both a teacher and someone who just engages with a lot of people generally is that community engagement aspect because you get the feeling from you know the politician's perspective that if they can keep the public getting very, very 
small bits of information, then they're a lot easier to manipulate when the elections come around. And yeah, that might be a bit of a cynical view. But <laughs> you think? The, <laughs> well, I guess if, if you can engage them at a level that is easier for more people to engage with, then I think it makes it a lot easier for you to maintain that. That, that position of power and until that breaks down I really don't see how we can how we can get that level of engagement out of our data. So here's an interesting thought experiment for you Bruce. I, I, I totally hear where you're coming from and um, you know where I can see by your um, Twitter handle that we're of a similar vintage so um, there's a you know there's a similar perspective um, informing this but um, here's an interesting thought for you. First of all we have a separation between the public service and the political service. Um, there has been a very very um, strict and specific um, implementation of the concept that there has to be a split and that the public service should be um, politically neutral and should be um, evidence-based and, and um, focused on you know trying to get the best outcome from an evidence-based scientific approach perspective. Now of course having seen that from both sides now um, uh, I'm just going to be careful how I frame um, but, um, Senator Kate Lundy was absolutely brilliant to work for and I have hold her in the absolute highest respect, but I could not have done that job for a lot of people um, up on the hill. It's, it is really quite a different world and quite, a, um, quite an interesting one. Um, if public policy from a public service perspective, right, if in developing public policy positions to put to a minister, the public service does that openly and transparently, and then it goes and, and then something is created um, collaboratively with a, a large community of people, then um, when it goes to the minister, if the minister wants to go a different way, you know, it is their choice and the public service has to do what they're directed to do, but now there is a, a, a level of an accountability and transparency to the decision-making process that doesn't currently exist, um, really. I mean, at the moment, public policy is, uh, you know, a, a position is put together, is put to a minister, it's all happened sort of behind the scenes, and the position that comes out, who knows where it came from. Um, the public service, I think, has incentive to do this, um, because it helps us. Transparency is actually the best defense for the public service to do its job. And I think it's actually similar for any of the traditional institutions that are not driven politically. Um, transparency actually gives us, gives people trust in what the work that we do. So transparency actually, there, there is incentive for the public service. Um, from a political perspective, transparency, you know, if you're actually doing a job well, and most people up there do believe they're doing their job well, then um, transparency actually works for them too. But the transparency isn't the primary motivator um, politically. The primary motivator is politically, in my view, and I'm just a person um, with a view, um, the primary um, motivations politically are, first of all, industry uh, innovation. Government cannot um, capitalize on, on information or data as an asset in the same way that, that industry can, that civil society can, that um, other people with other motivations can, that academia can. Um, second of all, there's the cost of um, of every department, particularly in federal government, sees itself as completely separate from every other bloody department. Um, and so the sharing of information across departments is very hard. Sorry, I, I am a gesticulator and I'm, I'm learning now where my hands can go on the camera, so you'll just have to excuse me getting more gesticulating. Um, but um, to share data from one department to another department, it actually takes a huge amount of, um, well not a huge amount, it, it takes a certain amount of work in terms of privacy, in terms of um, the legislative requirements to clean up that data to make it uh, appropriate to share across to another department. The work to do that um, is not that much less than the work that it takes to publish it publicly. So there is motivation to share data across departments and agencies because you get better policy outcomes, you get better um, reuse of that um, publicly funded data that's been captured, um, you get the better opportunity to do service delivery in new and interesting ways and I can tell you now one of the huge drivers for all of this stuff is changing how we do service delivery because service delivery has been put under the pump, um, you know, cuts after cuts after cuts, doing things the same way but for cheaper but we have to change the way that we do service delivery otherwise it becomes less relevant because of the changing expectations of our people. So, um, so change the service delivery is a big driver. Um, uh, uh, private and public innovation and um, uh, economic benefits that flow on from that is a big motivator um, and um, better policy outcomes and better policy development and analysis is a big motivator as well and keeping in mind that with that policy analysis with better data you can actually start to respond to new challenges and opportunities in a more agile way. I like to talk about a thing called, um, that I call anyway, iterative policy which is the idea that rather than setting a policy in stone and sitting on it for 10 years 
we start to say, okay, well, let's put it into action, let's monitor it, and let's iteratively change it as we go, so that we can actually have a continually adapting policy that actually, you know, is is continues to be responsive and useful to the to the changing circumstances. Mm. Failing fast. <laughs> Failing, fail fast, fail often. Mm. Which and they freak out, but that's okay. We need to explain and educate them on why that's a good thing. But mm. just to go back to your question, Bruce, the, um, I think there is a lot of motivation for this from different angles, and I, I think that the concept that we need to see a change in the power motivations before it will happen isn't, isn't actually true and become, does become an excuse for some people to, to just sit back and wait. We don't need to wait. We actually have all the policy in place, we have a lot of motivation in place, and we have a momentum right now that we've never had before, so we need to jump on it. Hmm. Peter, are there standards for this? Like, are, are there XML standards for doing this sort of thing about exchanging data between departments and between governments and between whatever other bodies want to share that data? So there's a bunch of standards for different types of data. So the moment I started looking at this space seriously, I realised that part of the problem is that um, there's a lot of different spaces and everyone's really focused on their little, little chunk. So the spatial people, you know, the, the spatial systems and standards out there are actually very, very good. Um, how it's shared, and, and there's been problems with that, but who's in spatial is just in spatial. Real-time data, there's some really good international standards, particularly around travel information, but around, you know, there's a bunch of different types of real-time data. So, sorry, spatial data, real-time data, tabular data, and um, let's call it census data, because accessing census data is a whole different thing when you uh, take into account the privacy ramifications and such. Um, but those four data types, just as a start, everyone's only focused on their one. So what I started doing was looking at, well, um, there are some countries where they've sort of started to look across. So in the UK, DataGov UK only hosts tabular data, but they point to geospatial services. And a lot of the geospatial services are well-known standards, you know, open standards. Interestingly enough, open standards has actually been one of the things which has um, got in the way of publishing data because a department will just say, well, we've only got this in uh, XLSX or whatever, and so we'll put it up. Um, oh, yeah, we've done our job for transparency. And yes, they have. They've taken a huge step just to get to that point. But then, of course, they get flamed, like, it's not CSV. Um, open, uh, when you put stuff into a proper open data platform, such as CCAN, such as, um, th there's a bunch of open data platforms out there now. Um, it shouldn't matter what format it was put up in. It should understand the format and be able to make that data available either to download in a, in a different format or to into or and to um to have access to an API and there are very well formatted open API standards uh, for for talking to data so um uh, of, of all different types the, the the answer to the question is there's there's a lot of different standards uh, there's a lot of good open standards around different types of data um, already available and so trying to leverage those where possible is good but if you say to a department um, you have to publish it in an open standard in the first instance that actually takes a huge amount of work and it actually becomes a barrier to them starting to publish, if that makes sense. So one of the things I'm working on is by getting, not that I can talk about it, but <laughs> hypothetically speaking, if an open data platform was hosted for all, you know, government then um, that actually made all the data automatically available as an API, then that actually reduces the barrier to publishing. Hmm. Okay. Wow, what a really rich discussion we've been having. Well, what a really interesting. <laughs> No, it's fascinating. Um, Pia, we've had a question on our Today's Meet page. It was probably um, more relevant a while ago, but I'm going to ask it anyway. So this question comes from Dean, and he's asked, is there a particular government that actually sets the open government standard? How is it created? So that's interesting. So um, there's no such thing as an open government standard right now. However, there was a very interesting project called the Open Government Partnership. I should have mentioned it before. Um, the Open Government Partnership is a international project which has, I think, about 65 countries signed up right now. Um, Australia is not signed up yet, but you know there is a, a lot of hope that we will be signed up at some point. Um, but um, the Open Government Partnership is really interesting because it's what they've tried to do is provide a framework, um, a consistency of defining open government. Um, and of um, getting countries to commit to a series of principles in the first instance, but also to commit to a series of um, actions and to actually write up an action plan about what they will do as a, as a government. And I'll just give you a, oops, I just went to the wrong website. Um, I'll give you just a little bit of an idea about it. Uh, but, um, but, and keeping in mind also that a lot of countries around the world, open data is like the least of their issues when it comes to open government. They're still trying to get parliamentary transparency. I mean, in this country, we actually 
publicly um, um, web stream all of our Senate estimates. We publicly web stream question time. We have answer. We actually have access to all the things that are said in our parliament, um, uh, all the official things that are said in our parliament. It's, it's actually hugely transparent here um, comparatively. And Open Australia as an organisation have massively contributed to the transparency of our parliamentary system. If you want to see you know, cutting edge uh, civil society um, contributing to open government, go and check out openaustralia.org. But uh, if you go to opengovpartnership.org, which is the Open Government Partnership website, um, the, basically they get um, all their countries to, um, uh, to agree to, hold on one second, they have like a declaration and they've got, they've got all this stuff. Um, that I think, it, mostly because no one else has done it but also because it is actually reasonably well thought through, will probably become a bit of a template for what open government means. So for instance, the declaration is things like um, we acknowledge that people all around the world are demanding more openness and creating a calling for greater civic participation in public affairs and seeking ways to make their governments more transparent, responsive, accountable and effective. Which goes pretty much to the heart of all the things I was talking about before. They talk about values, they talk about the increase of availability of information about government activity, um, standards of professional integrity. And again, in Australia, we have like a, um, a APS code of conduct. All the states have, you know, different code of con uh, have codes of conduct. We actually have a public service here that, in spite of the fact that ha it has been attacked in a lot of ways and blamed in a lot of ways for a lot of things, it still has a reasonable amount of respect. Um, I, I personally believe that the public service can only maintain its integrity if it actually engages directly with the people. Because at the moment it gets too caught up, people sort of, they see politics and they see the public service and they think it's the same thing. So when the politics stuffs up, they, um, they believe that the public service is stuffed up. And it, it couldn't be further from the truth in, in the vast majority of cases. So, um, so yeah, in answer to the question, I think the Open Government Partnership will probably be the thing that provides the template. So also Dean has just given a follow-up to his question and that is, um, is there a government that does Open Gov best? Is there an example? that you can actually give us of how that works and who's doing it? Sure. So the answer to that is no one's doing it perfectly. <laughs> uh, it's a bit like democracy, you know, it's, it's, um, it's terrible but it's the least worst of it. Anyway, um, but, every, but there's a bunch of governments doing particularly things really well. The UK government has done open data really well. Um, pr pr I think the best in the world. Um, they have I think about 10,000 data sets with about 60,000 individual files. Um, but they're useful, they're kept up to date, but the way they do it is particularly brilliant because it's not like a small team of people going out and trying to find data and publish it. They have three technical people only who run DataGov UK and those three people basically you know, uh, do function ads, they add new development, um, they create new plugins, they make it work, they provide technical support, they provide some um, automation services to the rest of government. But the, the trick to their policy, and we do not have this in Australia yet, and we need this in Australia, is that they have a policy which says every aspect of the UK government has to have a data pub. So 760 or so registered publishers of data throughout the UK government. Now if only 10% of those people are super active, that's a lot of people publishing data on a regular basis. That's one of the pieces that's missing. Finland and Sweden, I think, um, but a few countries sort of around there have done some really clever things around um, legislative and parliamentary transparency. So actually um, taking laws and actually developing them publicly and transparently and, um, and you know, using wikis and using different tools to actually say, okay, well, here's a draft of a law or here's, here's, here's something that we're thinking of um, drafting, what do you reckon? And actually co-developing laws for the country, which I find fascinating. I think Australia is certainly one of the leading countries when it comes to parliamentary transparency. I think that we're also um, doing some really clever stuff around public engagement, um, but I, I don't think we're quite up there with the leaders, but I think we're doing some really good stuff here. Um, the US um, went through a period of doing some really good stuff with regards to political engagement, but their public service engagement ha is a bit all over the place. I mean, um, the, the federal government and the, the, the relationship with the relationship between states and federal over there is very different to here and the relationship between the executive to the public service is very different from here. Um, but they're, they're doing some really good stuff around um, some of the cities over there doing amazing stuff with open data. Um, uh, it's worth actually having a look at. Again, if you actually go to the Office of the Information Commissioner's report from policy to practice, you'll find some of the best case studies throughout that report. There's some really, really good stuff there. 
Oh, and yeah. around Australia, we've got, oh, sorry, just quickly, we've got data.gov.au, work in progress. Um, there's uh, the Queensland Open Data um, Project, which was only launched, I think, a month or two, or a couple of months ago. Uh, data ACT, which was launched sort of mid last year, which I was involved in. And, um, and there's a lot of work happening in a bunch of other states as well. Yes, sorry. I was just, uh, just while you're doing that, I was just looking at uh, what you're talking about reminded me of something that Google's been doing called the public data, I think it's public data directory or public data search, where they, they're opening up a lot of public data sets for people to dig into and analyze in all sorts of ways. Is that the sort of data sets you're talking about? I haven't looked at it yet. Uh, what is it, the Google public data set? Uh, yeah, I'll give you its exact name. Public um, data explorer? Public, public data explorer, yeah. Uh, they're getting data from other places, so they're getting it from... Um, yeah, that, that's not from ours, but is that the kind of model you're talking about, where public data sets become available and yeah. anyone can then dig into that data yeah. and draw conclusions from it? Yep, yeah, and I mean the first step is to get the raw data available, and the UK I think has been the best at getting raw data available. If you want to look at the absolute world leading in terms of what to do with that data after you've got it, um, have a look at a guy called Hans Rosling. Um, Hans yeah, Rosling is... Yeah, I was about yeah. to mention his, that was my question. He's done some fantastic stuff for the data oh. visualization with Ted and Google. I show his videos to my students. Oh, and, so um, is that the same um, idea, with having much broader and further reaching by not just coming up with fancy visualizations, but gaining some traction for feedback to draw a population into governance? And yeah, absolutely. It gives you data visualization. And I mean, my background is very techy. Um, I used to think data visualization was that stupid thing you had to do for managers because they couldn't be bothered understanding their domain. Um, now I really have come to understand that data visualization gives you a new toolkit uh, to be able to understand something in a new way. I'll give you a, what's an example I can give you that I'm allowed to talk about. Um, I, I did a couple of years of computer forensics a few years ago, so I've been using a lot of those skills as well. So not only, because um, there's data visualization of being able to say, okay, let's take um, I'll give you a really cheeky one, and I hope you don't mind me using a bit of a cheeky one, but they did a, a data visualization of the religiosity, um, like the self-identified uh, religiosity of families in um, states in the U.S. and compared and age pregnancies, uh, found a direct correlation, <laughs> which was interesting. Um, so basically the more religious a state thought they were, the higher the number of teen um, pregnancies, which was fascinating. Um, but it gives you that opportunity to just sort of play with data. Um, one of the things that Hans is really famous for is he's, by plugging in all the information about, you know, life quality, um, he's been able to show that over the last hundred years the supposed gap between developed and developing nations has dramatically closed um, mm -hmm. and now um, the biggest gap you've got is actually within countries, not so much between countries. And, um, and the concepts, uh, there's a lot of people who build policy, particularly around things like aid, where their personal knowledge is actually 30 years out of date because, of course, that's when they went to school last. Um, so this ongoing... I actually think there's a real... Sorry, it just occurred to me that one of the big challenges we have is the concept of lifelong learning is very much underrated, but it's only through that iterative learning and constantly being open to the, con you know, to the things that you learned at school changing that you can actually make sure that your policy is up to date. Um, but yeah, data visualization gives you new knowledge. We, you might be able to say, okay, 90% of people's response to this idea was negative, but through being able to add in metadata and um, some community analysis and some linguistic analysis and, and forensic analysis generally, you can say, well, 75% of those people came from the same lobby company or, or from the same organization or the same demographic or the same town or whatever. So that context gives you a better opportunity to make sure that you're not being gamed. Yeah, I once heard Rosling say that trying to analyse data without a form of visualisation is like trying to listen to music uh, by only looking at the notes. Yeah, I think that's really true. And some people see data visualisation as, um, oh, you have to visualise it for the stupid people. Like there is this awful disdain of the general public that I that I come across um, from a lot of people. And um, it, you know, in, in politics, in the public service, in the industry, like you know, uh, just generally you. you know, you know, this down to the general public. Data visualization is exactly the opposite. It is me saying, okay, first of all, how, do, how can I find some new knowledge in this? But second of all, how can I communicate something in a way which is being respectful of other people's time? I don't want another person to have to go through the reading of the, you know, 50 hours on that topic to come to the same conclusion when I can demonstrate that in a way which is respectful of their time. Um, and now we can have a better public debate and dialogue around a really important issue. Climate change is a great example. I mean, it's been bastardized in terms of um, the, the public dialogue around it. 
and people don't understand them. They don't trust in the outcomes of other people, and it's been it's 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 a topic that's really important, but people are not engaged in it. So um, data visualization, I think, helps with those kinds of things. Yep, definitely. I remember it was quite a surprise when um, I started getting tweets from my local member, and every time she says something and it's recorded in Hansard, I get the uh, the link. I can click on it, and respond directly to her about what I thought about a tweet, and that's opened up the whole relationship. Um, mm. And I think that's really powerful. It also meant that when I was actually had a chance to work with her. Um, on a, um, a table, and someone made a sort of a cursory reference. Oh, she does nothing. I said, Well, no, actually, she's spoken about this, about the bushfires, and about the global climate change and links to global warming. And I know these were references she was making in Parliament that might have got missed. Mm. Um, my cousin uh, Sharon Guesthausen's in the uh, Senate in Parliament in the Netherlands. And I know when I was visiting her two years ago, um, she was very impressed with some of the changes that are happening in Australia, and they're hoping to pick up some of those ideas here. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Look, there's some great stuff happening over there, and I. Um, I, I guess I just want to just say one last thing, which is there, there is such a movement at the moment. There really is, and you can feel it. It's like it, it, open data isn't happening because you know there's a small number of people pushing it. It really is an idea that time has come, and um, and there's some great opportunities and um, some great momentum. So the the trick now is how to continue make grow. One of the other uh, moments in listening to you talk. Sorry, Jason, you go. Oh, so, Pia, given um, you're working with people who value power, and the old adage, knowledge is power, is, I'm sure, quite relevant to them, mm. do you see that we'll ever get to a point soon where access to data will be legislated so that they're actually, when they no longer, when there is a a chance that they're no longer seeing advantage to manipulating access to data, but they're being forced to release that data, we might see a greater acceptance of open data by everyone. I think, again, um, I think too many people assume nefariousness where it just it's just not. Um, most people are not getting in the way of opening data because they care about power. It's just the way that it's always been done. The fact that People like us who are very internet savvy, are very technology savvy, and for whom this is second nature. I mean, I've been involved in online communities now for 15 years. Gosh, I am getting old. Um, and um, the like, you know, it, it's it's second nature for us to do this stuff. Um, for a lot of people in government, it's just like, well, this is the way we've always done things. And when you say, well, hey, why don't we take that and, and release it publicly? Um, there is a lot of um, there's a lot of fear about changing the way things have always been done because that takes a lot of personal responsibility. That's you saying, I will take personal responsibility for the fact that I'm going to change something and do something completely new. That And that's simply not how a lot of people are conditioned. Um, so you're saying it's not a fear of what you're moving to, but more a fear of what you're moving away from. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And even with the two, I mean, we have a... <laughs> you know, I've got to be careful how I say this. We have a... Uh, I think we've lost our way mildly because the fear of embarrassing a minister is one of the biggest fears in the public service. And in my opinion, that is not good enough. Doesn't bother um, me at all. <laughs> well, it doesn't bother me at all. That's why I'm, you know, the lone wolf. But, but there is um, a huge change of guard happening in the public service. I mean, I think it's 50% of the SES, which is the Senior Executive Service, um, are actually retiring in the next five years. So there's quite a substantial generation change just around the corner. Um, but at the same time, there's all these policies that have been put in place. Um, and you go and listen to people like John McMillan, the Information Commissioner, or my boss. My boss is awesome. Um, he's the first ever Australian government, whole of Australian government CTO, uh, John Sheridan. Um, you go and listen to these people who are in the SES, and they are inspiring. They really get this stuff, and they really um, do great stuff. So it's not, I think a lot of people make the mistake of they're going, oh, well, when the next generation comes, it'll be fine. And it's not true. Um, what you need is you need thought leaders of, of every age. Um, and we need to encourage those thought leaders. Um, but it, it, so the, the so some of the fear is misplaced. Um, some most of it is just this is the way things have always been done. And changing a system, it does actually take time. People say, oh, I'll just put the CSV out, and it's like, yeah, but but then you want it updated every month, don't you? But then you want it to be timely. Then you want to have all the metadata. Then it does actually take work to put systems into place. However, a lot of that has been building up, and I think what you're going to see this year is a huge upswell in the amount of quality data being published uh, from the Australian Public Service across the states and, and um, federal. Good. So, Peter, do you think we'll get to the stage where the preamble on our new constitution will have a comment box underneath where you can just type in your ideas? Or perhaps um, 
the budget will become a Google, I'll credit Jason for this one, the budget will be a Google spreadsheet that anyone can sort of pop their own entries in and we could work it together? The latter, I think, is is um, definitely on, like, sooner rather than later. Um, I mean, getting access to the budget data um, in the first instance is important, um, but being able to actually, I mean, and they've already got projects like this around the world. There was a great project, I think it was in the, uh, there, there was one in the UK which was particularly clever where they basically said, um, I think it was a local, they said, I'm going to give you 20 credits, $20 effectively, and here are all the different programs, so you allocate the money the way that you think it should be allocated. And then people actually found themselves really having to consider, well, if I put my, more money into that one, then I'm taking away from that one. And that actually, it, not only was it a great public education perspective to give people an understanding of the complexity of trying to balance the budget, but it gave people a say that then they could go off and, and, um, and put into play. So I actually think that co-developed and co-designed approach is, is going to become much more popular. In terms of a comment page on the Constitution, well, you know, we've been so, so successful at getting referenda through this country in the past that, you know, I'm sure it'll work. <laughs> It's the vibe of the thing. <laughs> and not cynical at all there. <laughs> I, I, I was going to say before, the penny dropping moment for me tonight as I listened to your talk was it had never occurred to me that something like the budget figures exist in nothing more than a Word document. Yeah, I know. We just, and, and and there is no API as such for taking data and moving it. And, and I had never considered that. But that's a massive yeah. flaw, isn't it? Well, no, but it is, but it's not nefarious. See? No, 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 no. It's just, it's yeah. just um, not, not laziness is the wrong word. It's just oversight. It's just, it's just how it's always been done. It's enculturated into the way it's always been done. And it's enculturated, as you've just um, demonstrated, into the expectations people have. But the expectations are changing. Nah, right. And I think that's, that's probably where I was coming from earlier with, with my statement is it wasn't I, I guess it was never supposed to be interpreted as a nefarious thing or, or that way. Right. But it's common in not just the public service. Um, we see it in just about every organisation that there is a real lack of understanding of what's happening. I think the tech industry is probably a little bit different because it's working with it all the time. Yeah. But as a general rule, um, leaders just aren't aware of what is possible with big data because it's just above their head. Uh, it, 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 it's it's a, something that's very, very difficult to grasp if you don't mm. engage with it on a regular basis, I suppose. Um, and you yeah. know, it's really quite evident that that's, that's one of the big issues we're going to have to face here. And the funny thing is that, in a way, it's not our issue because that gap is slapping those people around the head um, and they are having, they are being forced to actually deal with it. So, um, you know, it's actually not our fight to fight anymore. We can just sort of get on with um, doing the good stuff. The best success we can have in this is actually by creating the demand, by demonstrating the value and by actually um, continuing to create the momentum effectively because the people who don't get it um, will not win elections because they won't actually be able to map to the changing expectations of the people. Very exciting. Mm -hmm. It is very exciting and I like the idea that you shared earlier about, and I, I guess I'm doing a bit of a wind up here for um, the group, but about the idea of a, a school as an API. That was just yeah. fascinating. You've I given me that. It's, it's a, it just flips everything around. I've just got so many ideas I just want to kick around now and uh, reflect back. <laughs> Well, I mean, also think about so many of the basic techie sort of things. The the fail early, fail often was another good example. But write once, you know, publish everywhere. That uh, anyone that understands that intuitively is more effective at getting their message across. Anyone who doesn't understand that intuitively doesn't. Anyone who understands intuitive, anyone who, the amount of times I've had conversations with people in government about the the black art of public consultation online, and you know, because I'm a, I'm a master at dealing with trolls. You know, I deal with kernel hackers. I'm <laughs> I'm pretty good at it. Um, but um, the, the, and the black art comes down to this, like the core piece of thing that I, I could always say to them is, look, if you don't want people's opinion, if you genuinely don't actually want their perspective, don't call it a consultation. Um, call it something else. If you call it a consultation and you don't actually care what they say, then you're coming from it, null it and they will respond badly and you will blame the technology and you will blame the trolls and you will blame all these things, but what it really comes down to is you came from a wrong premise. So there's a lot of a lot of culture shift that's starting to happen in government, and um, it's a good time. Anyway, we've. I'm, I'm sorry. I've Note to self. Talked about the studies about that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mm. 
I'm going to man this agents for my kids, for my students for homework. So we're going to go sit down and write a summary up here because there's some good stuff here. Um, I might start a bit of a wind up. So, uh, Bruce, if uh, you could uh, give us a bit of a wrap. Oh, look, personally, I just, I've just really enjoyed listening to what's going on here. I think, um, you know, as someone who's always been interested in data and how it's used and understanding that some of the problems that we face in schools with having people understand what is possible now with the technology we've got available to us and the data that's starting to become accessible, um, there's, there are a lot of opportunities that we really need to grab and it's really, really positive to hear that it's not just us as teachers that are seeing that, but it's something that you're going to see right across the board because I think that's where it's, we're really going to start to see value, not just in education, but in other, in other industries and areas as well. Chris. Oh, Pia, I've always said you're one of the smartest women I know and it's good to see you doing something in a place where it's Aww. going to actually do some good. Thank um, you. Do you reckon the, the general Australian public are ready for it? I know, I know you say there's a driver for change and I can certainly feel that. But I think you and I and the people in this room and probably people watching and listening to this, I don't know if we represent the average um, no, we don't. person. And, and I think all this makes a great deal of sense to us, but you go to you know the heartland, as they say, mm. and I think there'd be a lot of people scratching their heads about this, don't you think? Absolutely, when you go into the detail. But the fact is, well, okay, sorry. My impression is that um, people out there, the the normal average people, that's called average, but um, well, I guess statistically they are. But anyway, um, they <laughs> are. Yeah, by definition, they are absolutely um, adopting these um, changing expectations because they are online. Um, the moment you go online and you are and and being online becomes a part of you. Uh, you carry your mobile around. You you're googling stuff. You're 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 using social media. You're you're blogging, or well, maybe not blogging, but you might just be putting your stuff on Facebook. But you, the moment that um, not the moment. There's not a definitive moment, I don't think, but. Being online changes you and changes your expectations, and we are seeing that with um, the, the broader community. And it's because the broader community's perspective and expectations are changing that this is a fundamental um, shift that we're seeing, as opposed to just um, a, a small number of you know troublemakers like us. Mm -hmm. um, I I am very very optimistic about the future because even though you still see a lot of um, misinformed perspectives. And even um, I, and I mean, maybe I'm just very convincing, but I can have a conversation with anyone, and um, and it can be mutually respectful, and we can we can you know um, we can get to a, a better place. I think that if um, the traditional institutions that are used to being the bastions of information and the bastions of power and the the the, the source of truth um, start to actually recognise that we're not um, and engage with people respectfully. Um, and and in an informed way. I mean, Machiavelli. You know, I do love to quote Machiavelli. You know, always said that um, one of the greatest threats to democracy was an uninformed public. It is our job, yours as educators, me as a public servant. It is our job to actually um, educate and inform and open data and open information and have um, make sure that um, good quality uh, peer-reviewed information is actually publicly available, so that we can have a better informed. Um, um, public debate about important issues because at the moment wherever you don't have, have out there it gets filled with crap because the moment there is a topic there is a vacuum and unless you fill that vacuum with quality it gets filled with with stuff that, that is bad. I'll just finish on that. I think I've run out of words. <laughs> mm, that's good. When do we get uh, paperless elections? Ah, yeah, we're, we're, maybe when Diebold shuts down and goes away. Oh, hang on. Come on. I, I like scrutineering and looking at those pieces of paper and stuff. There's a bit of a job there for us, for our legions. Um, Jason. <laughs> yeah. Jason. Well, cer certainly as an academic, I love open data and I love getting access to any data I can. But in a previous incarnation, I was an intelligence analyst and I also know how people can interpret data in very interesting ways um, for all sorts of radical fringe groups, such as yep. the media or. Um, groups interested in various political agendas or m the more extreme agendas, they'll grab what they believe is raw data and interpret it in many different ways that could open up a whole lot of interesting debates that <laughs> when the data was more filtered um, may have addressed. But it's an interesting, brave new world I think we're all going into and I certainly enjoy the trip.
is the old lies, damn yeah. lies, and statistics, right? And, and I will just respond to that briefly because I think that's a really important point. Um, th this is where having the raw data available means that you become the authoritative source of the data. And where people, when, you, when we get to a point where someone hears something from anyone and goes to the source to see or goes to see what the reviews of the source were or whatever, then we're in a better place. Whereas at the moment, they hear a politician say something and a doctor say something and they'll believe the doctor because they think a politician is full of it and that may or may not be based on evidence either way. Um, people are making decisions on to trust um, based on emotion, not so much on, um, in a lot of cases anyway, not so much as... In the past, those same groups just went and made those numbers up. So by having the data publicly available, you have an opportunity to be able to um, introduce some critical thinking into the equation that doesn't exist when that data isn't available. In a rational world, that would certainly be the case. <laughs> well, we can only hope, yeah? Yes. <laughs> Amanda. Well, like you, Roland, I'm kind of struck by the, the idea of government as API and what that means in terms of school as a API, as the interface for knowledge to help students with learning and, and also the idea of um, the data we have and what we could what data we could have and how do we access it, how do we visualise it, how do we use it with students to inform their learning. Um, another really powerful thing that you said, Pierre, was that um, lifelong, le lifelong learning and the iterative policy kind of process, which I love. You should totally coin that. Um, and Thanks. I think that's definitely a way that I view learning as that iterative process and even from a policy perspective policies in schools I think should be iterative in that same kind of way. Um, you also talked about fear and the idea that what we have to let go of is possibly scarier than the fear of what we have to gain mm. um, and I'm also thinking open government, all of that, open data, what about open teaching, open learning, open school? What would that mean? What would that look like? So you've certainly sparked my brain and I'm sure I won't be able to sleep because I'll be thinking about data and stuff all night. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's oh, okay. I'm, I love it. That's lovely. I'm, I'm starting to think of open education. Now you've got me thinking there, Amanda. Um, I guess um, I, I feel quite good. counting sheep, but at least the numbers are open. <laughs> <laughs> Might not be binary, it'd be the same sheep jumping over the gate and then there'd be a NAND gate and an OR gate. Um, now, Yes Minister, um, series episode one um, was about open government and the Minister was asked a question for a chair for his desk and one of the WAGs said there were two kinds of chairs to go with two kinds of Ministers. It's one sort that folds up instantly and the other one goes round and round in circles. And I guess Amanda, what you've given us is um, rocket chairs for our Ministers and your promise for the public hoverboards. So I reckon it's really exciting being able to move and to gain traction and to take us to new places. So it's really wonderful. Um, I'd like to just uh, call it close for tonight. It's been a wonderful thing. Um, next week we're planning another ACCE LN broadcast and you can view our past Hangout recordings at acceln.wikispaces.com. Amanda, I'll let you close tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, everyone on our panel this evening and a big thank you for um, to Pia for sharing all of her wonderful wisdom and knowledge oh. and data with us. It's truly wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure and wonderful to get all of your perspectives and questions too, so thank you. And keep up the good work. We're all in this together, yeah? Mm. Too right. Thank you. Bye, everybody. <laughs>